Her attorney Tanya Asim Cooper. Attorney Cooper serves as director of the Restoration and Justice Clinic and assistant clinical professor of law. Professor Cooper's research focuses on domestic violence in the Christian church. Together with her research colleagues, Dr. Rosalind M. Satchel at Seaver College and Dr. Thema Bryan Davis, uh, Graduate School of Education and Psychology, Professor Cooper has received over $100,000 in grant funding from Pepperdine University to support their project, Domestic Violence in the American Christian Church, Current Trends and Effective Resources. In 2017, they hosted an interdisciplinary conference in search of sanctuary, strengthening the church's response to intimate partner violence. In 2018, Professor Cooper received a fellowship to attend the Summer Research Institute at Harris Manchester College in the University of Oxford. So please welcome me, I mean, join me in welcoming Attorney Cooper. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here, and what a great turnout. Y'all look wonderful, and I'm really excited already by the energy um, and the power that this conference and this rally is bringing to this campus and, and really to start a movement here. So, so I am a lawyer by training. I also have a master's degree in psychology, um, and my background has been working uh, with vulnerable populations and victims of child abuse, domestic violence, and human trafficking. Trafficking. One of the things that I'm going to be talking about today and then this afternoon are um, what is domestic violence specifically, how does that manifest, and then uh, later on uh, this afternoon I'm going to be talking about what happens when domestic violence comes to the attention of the faith community and sometimes the secondary harm and trauma that a faith community can then inflict on victims of domestic violence. So let's start off just talking about domestic Domestic violence, domestic violence, another word, also relationship violence. A lot of students in particular think I'm not, uh, it can't be domestic violence because I don't live with my boyfriend, I don't live with my abuser. We're not in a domestic relationship, we're not in a domestic partnership. Um, but relationship dating violence also counts. It's also uh, known as intimate partner uh, abuse or intimate partner violence. So I'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, so let's just start by thinking about what are some of the uh, implicit assumpt uh, assumptions and stereotypes in the world about domestic violence. Um, you may have heard some of these before. Uh, if it's so bad, why doesn't she just leave? So uh, some of the uh, presenters, the previous presenters, have talked about the gendered nature of relationship violence. Yes, men are victims too, but this is predominantly um, a field where women are victimized. And so I will use gendered pronouns. So if it's so bad, why doesn't she just leave? She must be asking for it. Uh, she must be um, okay with it. Um, and if she hasn't left yet, then maybe it's not really happening. Another thing is, this doesn't happen in my neighborhood. It only happens in, um, low income or certain uh, uh, racial or ethnic uh, neighborhoods, but the truth is that uh, domestic violence or relationship violence happens uh, among all races, ages, religions, and socioeconomic uh, levels. No neighborhood is immune. Another myth, she must be provo provoking him, something that she's done, maybe it's that she's perpetrating emotional abuse and that's gonna justify him acting out um, and acting out physically, so um, there must be something wrong with her. And anyway, I know him and he seems like a really nice guy. Many abusers are not violent outside the intimate partner relationship. They can be charming to outsiders, and it doesn't indicate the type of person that they are behind closed doors. Um, so let's explore, uh, and then the final one is domestic violence is only physical abuse. This is a big one for courts. 
Because physical abuse is likely the easiest to prove. It's easy to prove you have a black eye because the victim shows up in court and has a black eye, or there are pictures of bruises. The other types of abuse, sexual, emotional, they're harder to prove, and so there's less evidence, and so the victim um, will face uh, more skepticism. So these are some of the assumptions, but let me share with you the definition of domestic violence. So this is according to the American Bar Association Commission on Domestic Violence and Sexual Violence. Domestic violence is a pattern of behavior in, one, in which one intimate partner uses physical violence, coercion, threats, intimidation, isolation, or emotional, sexual, or economic abuse to control the other partner in the relationship. Domestic violence does not necessarily involve physical violence, and it equally affects all aspects of our society, rich or poor, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin. Okay, um, we saw with the last presenter, uh, with Sarah, a power and control wheel, and I'm gonna show you another one as well. This power and control wheel was developed by researchers in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, I believe in the 80s, and these are all the different kinds of abuse um, or the tools an abuser could use. Um, and it can manifest in physical violence or sexual violence, so you see the, um, the outside of the, the wheel, the spoke of the wheel there, and then inside are the different kinds of abuse. So I'm starting top right, intimidation, making her look, uh, making her afraid by using looks, actions, and gestures, smashing things, destroying property, abusing pets, displaying weapons. Emotional abuse, putting her down, you're nothing without me, you're a bee, you're a whore, no one will ever believe you making her think she's crazy. Our first presenter talked about gaslighting um, and playing mind games, humiliating her. Isolation, controlling what she does, who she sees, who she talks to, what she reads, where she goes, limiting her outside involvement, using jealousy to justify actions. Some of the um, college students that I've represented um, in my legal clinics have told me the way in which this um, plays out is increasingly the boyfriend tells them, I don't want you to be friends with that person. I want you to uh, wear dresses. I want you to wear your hair long. Uh, I, you don't really need to go and see your parents this weekend. They don't really like me and increasingly isolating the victim from others. Minimizing, denying, and blaming. Making light of the abuse, not taking concern seriously, saying the abuse didn't happen. So one of my clients, um, a, a college student, uh, she was in her apartment one night um, and she was doing her homework and her boyfriend came over and he wanted to go out. And uh, she said, no, you know, I really need to finish my homework right now. And he grabbed her laptop and he threw it against the wall and he smashed it. At that point she knew, okay, something bad is gonna happen. He's done this before, but he's never actually smashed my laptop when I have said I don't wanna go out. And so she made uh, her way to the door of the apartment. He caught her before she was able to get outside of the apartment and she is actually now in the doorway trying to get out and he's pulling her back in and she actually between trying to get out and him pushing her back in, she falls so she's lying halfway outside and halfway inside and he takes the apartment door and he smashes it repeatedly into her and then tells her later, I'm sorry that you fell. I'm sorry that you tripped. So again, minimizing what he did and what actually happened. So using children, making her feel guilty about the children. Um, you're you're uh, gonna lose custody if you leave me. No, you're gonna be a bad mother. No one is going to believe you. They're gonna believe me. This happens all the time in courts. Um, economic abuse, preventing her from getting a job or keeping a job, making her ask for money. I am not going to give you money for groceries this week unless you have sex with me right now. Um, male privilege, treating her like a servant, making all the big decisions, acting like the master of the castle, uh, and I have some more examples later, and coercion or threats. Um, I'm gonna kill you if you leave. I'm gonna kill myself if you leave, um, are all examples of um, abuse. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, and uh, as Sarah mentioned, um, some of the truths about abusers in the last, their belief system requires constant evidence that they're in control, and the proof of that control is that the victim complies. And the victim complies because the victim knows I'm going to get beaten if I don't comply. I'm going to get raped if I don't comply. He might kill me, he might kill himself, and they believe um, that the abuser will take um, these actions. Okay, so more on coercive control and the power and control taxes, as Sarah mentioned. So abusers absolutely believe that they are entitled to control, and separation or leaving is the most dangerous time for a victim. Um, and, and that's when we see lethality rates go sky high. Um, on average, it takes a victim about seven times to leave an abusive relationship before they are actually able to to be free. Um, and we talked about the gender nature, so most often male perpetrated on female. Evan Stark is a researcher, and he talks about coercive control in this way as really a domestic terror situation in which the victim is held hostage, hostage by her abuser. And uh, this quote here is that, Coercive control jeopardizes the individual liberty and autonomy as well as safety and centered on the micro-regulation of women's default roles as wife, mother, homemaker, and sexual partner. Okay, more rules of an abuser. I make the rules and I am entitled to you, your obedience, services, affection, loyalty, fidelity, and undivided attention. You cannot leave without my permission and you can't tell anyone of the abuse. Um, this is why, as Sarah mentioned, it's so hard for abusers to change. Batterers intervention program, they're regularly ordered um, in the process of a court hearing as part of the remedy and they're very, uh, ineffective. The efficacy rates for batter's intervention programs are very low because it requires a you know, cognitive mind shift. You have to undo this way of thinking that you've been uh, trained uh, to believe and that you've um, had to exert on the, uh, the victim and the victim has complied and that has justified and reinforced those behaviors. Okay. Um, so more um, uh, on the batterer's belief system and how they justify the behaviors through their own rulemaking authority, compliance, excusing their own behaviors, um, and that they're entitled to the restrict freedom and rights of the victims. And the way in which a lot of abusers will manipulate intervention systems, as we, I've seen this play out, um, so an abuser uh, who's familiar with um, very intimately familiar with his victim and she's tried to leave six times and he knows when she leaves she's going to go to the local domestic violence shelter and the domest local domestic violence shelter will tell her one of her, your options is to go and try to seek a domestic violence restraining order so you can go to the courthouse and ask for help or go to a legal services organization and ask for help and the abuser knows on the seventh time when she's left, she's going straight to the domestic violence shelter. So I am going to beat her to the court and I'm going to go and talk to the legal services organization and I'm gonna tell them, well, actually she was the one really abusing me and you know she's been um, abusing me and, and uh, emotionally abusing me and calling me all these names and telling me that I'm worthless to try to get uh, representation from the legal services organization. And so when the victim comes, they've already talked to the abuser and now there's a conflict of interest and they're not able to talk to the victim. So that's one way of manipulating intervention systems. So it's important to talk about what domestic violence is not. It's not a bad relationship or lack of communication. And there are a lot of bad relationships. You, can, uh, you might have uh, experienced something where, you know what, we just didn't get along, or we were in different places, we had different priorities at, this, you know, uh, at different times, and so it just didn't work out. That's not domestic violence. Domestic violence is coercive control. There's also a lot of times uh, during divorce or custody battles, bad behavior will come up and, and that will come out in the nature of the public proceeding. And again, that is not domestic violence. Domestic violence is also not a result of an anger uh, or alcohol or drug problem. However, alcohol and drugs can exacerbate um, an, abusive, uh, an abuser's uh, behaviors. 
And we talked about it, and it's not because of something the victim said or did that causes domestic violence. So let's look at uh, victims. So there's no profile for victims uh, other than most are female. Uh, it's not a character flaw. There's not something wrong with them. And a lot of times people have trouble believing victims because they say, oh, when she told me that her boyfriend was beating her up or forced her to have sex, she was laughing, so they can't be, you know, they can't be true. Um, or she wasn't crying or she had completely flat affect when she was telling me these horrible things. And that's because victims, um, their, their reaction to trauma are widely different than what we may expect. And so that doesn't mean they're not telling the truth. Um, so there is no specific uh, character or personality trait for a victim. So back to the myth, why does she not leave? There are so many reasons why victims don't leave, for the sake of the children, fear, because they love this person that they're married to or that they're dating, and they believe them and they hope that the abuser is going to change. Because they're embarrassed, you know, I don't want to go and tell my friends and family that um, all of this has been happening to me. They're going to think that something's wrong with me. Um, and because I don't have any more, anybody else I can tell anymore, I, I don't have any more friends, and I'm now estranged from my family because this is what my husband wanted. Um, or because where am I going to go? I don't have any place to go. And I, you know, I can't go to the shelter. I can't take my pets to the shelter. Or the, um, the shelter won't take uh, boys uh, older than uh, 12 years old. So I'm stuck. I don't have anywhere to go. Because my religion tells me it's a sin to leave. Because my religion tells me it's a sin to get divorced, which I'm going to talk about later this afternoon um, in more detail. Um, and so, uh, and believing their partner really needs them, and because they don't have faith that if they leave, something is actually going to happen, that people are going to believe them and be able to give them information and help. And this is borne out because uh, the response to women who do report is often very bad. Um, we're not going to, you know, we don't, we don't want to necessarily believe you, or maybe you contributed to the violence, or because your reaction is not what we expected, it didn't happen. Um, or you're just making this up because you want to get an advantage in the divorce or custody proceeding. Um, a lot of women who uh, report domestic violence who have children, and either the children have witnessed the domestic violence or um, have also been victims of um, violence by the perpetrator, um, often the, the victim is the one blamed. Well, you, you didn't protect your children, so we can't be sure that you're going to be able to take care of them going forward, and we're going to call uh, Department of Social Services and Child Protective Services and in initiate an investigation on you, on the victim, and then uh, blaming her for the violence or withdrawing support. I just want to give you some statistics, and these are from California, where um, where I am based. Um, but but first, the, the first uh, um, statistic: domestic violence is a nationwide ec epidemic. Um, according to, and we've heard some of these statistics before, uh, but according to the ABA, to the Centers uh, for Disease Control, the World Health Organization. Um, it's actually close to one in three women will experience domestic violence or intimate partner violence in her lifetime. Um, and 1.3 million women are victims of domestic violence each year. Um, so in 2014, there were almost 300 victims of uh, domestic violence homicides in California. And in LA County alone, there were almost 40,000 domestic violence related calls. Um, and a weapon was involved in over 25,000 of those calls firearm, knife, or cutting instrument, other dangerous weapon, or uh, personal weapon. I want to share with you um, some of the laws. Now, domestic violence is a crime in all 50 states. Um, 
Here is what California's law, for example, says. Abuse is defined as intentionally or recklessly cause or attempt to cause bodily injury or sexual assault or to place a person in reasonable apprehension of imminent serious bodily injury to that person or another. And the types of behavior the Domestic Violence Prevention Act covers are hitting, pushing, breaking furniture, threatening pets, sexually assaulting, punching, attacking, striking, stalking, or threatening to do all of the above. Um, what's uh, new changes in the laws of 2014, um, credible personation or false impersonation. We talked a little bit about surveillance and stalking, but also hacking into your uh, phone or hacking into your email and pretending to be the victim is also now considered domestic violence in California. Um, uh, C, abuse is not limited to the actual infliction of physical injury or assault, which is huge. It's not just physical violence, but it is harder to prove the other types of violence. And now disturbing the peace is also considered um, uh, uh, part of domestic violence in California. And disturbing the peace can entail sending... 50 text messages over the course of 20 minute period or showing up at the victim's house and just pacing back and forth for hours without making any sort of contact, without knocking on the door while the victim is inside would be enough if I was that person to rattle my nerves as well. And that's also now considered uh, domestic violence. Um, in uh, California, domestic violence is broad, and many states are like this as well. It's a spouse, former spouse, cohabitant or former, someone in a dating relationship, also could be a parent or someone rel related within a second degree, so a grandparent. Um, I want to share with you, and I hope this is going to work, um, what Evan Stark says about coercive control. This short video, I hope, will, will give you an idea. We're going to be able to hear it. Evan Stark is the researcher who um, has really um, come up with the term um, coercive control, which um, our first presenter, Jennifer, talked about, is now actually part of um, uh, the UK's laws. And so people, uh, uh, d coercive control is now um, akin to domestic violence and considered a crime um, in terms of the micro-regulation of uh, the victim and in the domestic terror situation. We'll just give it a couple, couple more seconds, a few more seconds, and see if we can get it. Okay. Yeah, it might be a separate audio cord. Okay. Okay, maybe if there's time, we can uh, show it again. It's, it's a very short clip, um, but... Uh, ...relationships that come to the attention of so the police uh, or the health okay, healthcare okay. system. The second thing that domestic violence laws do not even begin to reach uh, is, the, is the following, and, and this, makes, this is a paradox. The first thing we know is that the domestic violence laws do not even begin to touch on 
the pattern of violence that exists typically. Okay, so uh, the, the laws and uh, the remedies under the law are limited, as he just mentioned, and so what can we do? What can we do to help victims? What can we do as a community? We can listen, right? As the other um, presenters have already said, listen, and I tell my students, um, the best thing to do is to listen and to say to a victim, I believe you. Simple, right? And then I can connect you with resources if that's what you want. But you can't tell and you should not tell anyone, um, why don't you just leave? Why haven't you just left? Because a victim is the expert of their own abuse and are going to know what's going to happen uh, and the consequences uh, of leaving. And we know that leaving is the most dangerous time for a victim. So listen, believe, and help connect them with resources. Um, and that's it for now. <laughs>